anti-Semitism is growing around the world. So it's ever more important that we take a stand for the word of God and the priority of Israel in the plan of God. Amazingly, in Dearborn, Michigan, just a few days ago, September 29th, they were holding, the Muslims were holding a vigil for Hezbollah Secretary General Nasrallah. It was also happened to be the time whenever our New York slime, I mean, New York Times, um, wrote, a, wrote an article praising this terrorist leader who was the man behind the death of almost 400 U.S. Marines back in the 80s. But the whole group, and there's a video that you can see online at memory.org, M-E-M-R-I.org. I highly recommend that you go to that website, memory.org, and check out uh, what they have on there. That man watches what is going on behind the scenes uh, around the world, especially in the Arabic countries, to tell you what they're really saying. They'll say one thing in English and something else in Arabic. And he uh, keeps us all posted. He has a video from just September 29th where this whole crowd was chanting in the streets in the Moscow uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, chanting, Oh, beloved Nasrallah, destroy Tel Aviv. Oh, Jews, the army of Muhammad will return. Death to Israel. We heed your call, oh, Nasrallah. I would call that hate speech, would you not? I would call that calling for the murder of someone. All of that is illegal. However, because they're Muslim, it won't happen. Now, this gets up on YouTube. I may get put off YouTube. That's okay. The feast we're looking at is Rosh Hashanah. It's the first of the fall feasts. Everybody should have one of these little papers with you tonight. If you don't have one, raise your hand. We'll get you one. Anybody? Okay, we got some right over here. Who's got some for me? Right up here on the front. We should have, do we have enough left? Oh, okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, and uh, for those uh, online, I can uh, forward this uh, to you. I didn't get a chance to get it sent out uh, today. Rosh Hashanah. Uh, according to According to the All Israel News, this, since the founding of the nation of Israel, this is the first Rosh Hashanah that Israel has been at war. The war continues, as you know, but Chosen People's Ministry wrote this, and it said, with several dozen rockets and missiles bombarding Israel every day, ongoing terror attacks upon civilians, and 101 hostages still in captivity, plus the aftermath of the hurricanes on top of economic upheaval and social turmoil in America, and wars and rumors of wars around the globe. These holy days seem more precious and sacred than ever. So it's important for us to remember, and there's more coming, but we have to remember that the roots of our faith are Jewish. This didn't just happen in a vacuum. Jesus was Jewish. The first church was all Jewish. It was the Jews that through the Abrahamic covenant brought in the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach himself. It was the Jewish people that wrote the scriptures that you have in your hand. And that is the blessing that they gave to the whole world, both Messiah and the scriptures, the word in both cases. The only way of salvation is through Messiah, Yeshua, and his promise of eternal life. Amen. The feasts all point to the Jewish and the world's Messiah, Yeshua. So the Feast of Trumpets, also known as Rosh Hashanah, uh, is, the, is the Jewish New Year. We'll explain that in a second. Uh, it begins today at sundown on end Friday at sundown here of this year, 2024. The Feast of, or the Rosh Hashanah is also called the Feast of Trumpets. Um, the Jewish tradition states that this feast marks the anniversary of the creation 
of the world. You have a chart in there that shows you the seven feasts and how they are fulfilled. Passover, the, the spring feasts or Passover, which was fulfilled, of course, and we'll study this with all of these first four, let's put it this way, were fulfilled with the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fall feast will all be fulfilled with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially when we understand the second coming has two aspects. The one is the rapture of the church, and then the second coming following the tribulation period. The tribulation period itself fulfills the next to last, that is atonement. Uh, this year... Rosh Hashanah is October 2 through 4. Yom Kippur is October 11 and 12. Um, we will have on Sunday the 12th a special service um, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Uh, both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are new for us. Most of the other feasts we've all been doing, uh, but um, we will be adding these to it. And then the Sunday the 20th is when we'll be celebrating Sukkot, which is the Tabernacles, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Booths, all the different names for it, actually is 16 to 18 of this month. But that Sunday is a potluck meal. Now, somebody already asked me, do we have to cook Jewish food? You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Uh, you can just cook whatever you want. It's a, it's a potluck. And if some of you want to go to all the trouble or whatever to try and make Jewish food, that's great. We have Jewish food right down here tonight. It's real simple. I want everybody to try it. It's apples. You dip it in honey. The only thing we ask is when you pull out the apple and dip it in the honey, don't double dip. That's, that's the only thing we ask. But I, I'd like everybody to try it because it is a tradition with uh, Rosh Hashanah. The primary reason for it, by the way, is because they want to have a sweet new year. And that's the why. So there's the feast. It starts with Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. All have already happened. Feast of trumpets, day of atonement, and feast of tabernacles lie in front of us. The feasts were part of the Mosaic law that was given to the children of Israel. Leviticus 23. Why don't you open your Bible to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, they were given to the children of Israel uh, as a means or, or as a celebratory and feasting and fasting time uh, for the nation. <laughs> uh, but then also there's the typology or the pictures that go with it, uh, predicting the Messiah and the or the Lord Jesus Christ, Messiah, Yeshua. Uh, Yeshua. Uh, so we will look at all of those in a very big hurry tonight. Um the last time I was teaching it, I estimated it took me about eight weeks to teach what I'm going to try and do tonight in one class. So consider it not only edited, but if I start speaking in tongues, it doesn't mean I have the second blessing. There was They were commanded by God to celebrate seven feasts over a seven-month period with a four-month break in between the spring and fall appointed times. The Feast of Trumpets is laid out just in Leviticus 23, 23 and 24. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. And then the next one gives a command for it. You shall not do any laborious work, but you'll, you shall present uh, an offering by fire to the Lord. A simple understanding of it. If you look at the Jewish calendar, you realize that the Nisan is the first of the months. You have it there in front of you in your chart. Uh, God established the order of the months, Exodus 12 and uh, 1 through 3 and 14 through 18. The first month began uh, in Nisan when Passover was. But it's interesting because right now, uh, the Jewish New Year is all the way down in the seventh month. And I'll explain why that is uh, in a moment. Nisan, the first month, marked the redemption of Israel from Egypt, thus the Passover. And if you look at Leviticus 23, you could take on the side of your Bible and write these in real quick. Uh, I, did I put 
put this in your notes? I can't remember if I did. Yes, it is on the on the top of the page right behind the chart. I would suggest that you mark Leviticus 23 with this. Verse 5 of Leviticus 23 is the Passover. <clears throat> verse 6, unleavened bread. First fruits is verse 10. Weeks or Pentecost is verse 15. And then there's a four-month interval. And then you have trumpets at 24 and 27 on down following all the way down through uh, 36. Uh, and you can see it for yourself. You can follow down to discover the ending one on each one of these. You have the Day of Atonement. And then beginning at 39 through basically the end of the chapter, you have booths or tabernacles. Now, it's interesting because Rosh Hashanah, they say, is somewhat of an enigmatic day. It's hard to know exactly what it was. It says something about, uh, you shall have a rest, a reminder by the blowing of trumpets. We don't have time to go into it. We did it before. Uh, but the question is a reminder of what? <laughs> the scripture doesn't say. But in the analysis of it, it boils down to one thing more than anything else. There's multiple things you can say about what it's to remind people of. But more than anything, it's to remind people of the promise of the coming Yeshua, the coming Messiah. Um, but the day was marked by the blowing of the shofar. Now, if I, I told you once before, I used to have a shofar from Israel. thought it was wonderful. So did my dog and he ate it. So that was, I, I, I looked at my, you know, so far, and it had all these bite marks all over it and chew marks. And, and uh, all I could say was what Joshua said at Jericho when the walls came down after the blowing of the shofar, he said, shofar, show good. Anyhow, the, so the word shofar simply means a horn for blowing. So that's, it's usually made from a ram's horn. And it's connected because of the ram's horn to what happened with Abraham and Isaac and the and these the lamb that the, the ram that the Lord provided and so forth. They they can use other horns, but the ram's horn is the most common. It's the smaller horn. The Bible never connects Rosh Hashanah with the Feast of Trumpets. The reason it doesn't is because, like I said, the 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 biblical new year begins with Nisan. Uh, Nisan is at the beginning of the year as the Lord with the Passover, and it falls falls in the March-April time frame for us on our Gregorian calendar. Uh, but we're in the month of Tishri. Uh, that, that was established that way, coming out of the Babylonian captivity. Um, but um, the new year for the Bible is with the Passover with the coming out of the land of Egypt. Wow. I, that, I, I don't know if that was the last Trump or not, but I'm glad that you didn't have dentures. Last time Lulu did that, her dentures got invented right up here. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, you should have. So it says this, on the first day of the seventh month, you're to have a day of Sabbath rest. By the way, people talk about having days off and so forth. You realize that the the number of days off that the Jews had exceeded 30 days out of, out of the year. That was their days off, sometime even more than that. I do no regular work, but present a food offering to the Lord. It's also known as Yom Hatarah, which means the, the uh, day of blowing, Rosh Hashanah, first of the year. So forth. It means the beginning of the year. Mark's the beginning of this new year. It was in biblical times a day of rest and offerings. The symbols of Rosh Hashanah includes the ram's horn, apples dipped in honey, pomegranates, um, other special things, including a good wine, all of those things there with Rosh Hashanah. That's why I want you to make sure and try an apple dipped in honey, just so you can say you did. Uh, honey represents sweetness for the coming year. Jewish tradition says that, and it's only Jewish tradition, but it says that God created the world um, on this day, the day of the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, based on Job 38, 7, where we looked at it in the angelic conflict, where it says when God created the heavens and the earth, that the angels shouted for joy 
So this day is also called the day of shouting for joy. It's supposed to be a happy day and a rejoicing day generally as far as parts of it are concerned. I have to leave it at that. Uh, the trumpets were sounded when they went into the sanctuary, the Kadosh, it was the Kadesh, the, the holy place, Kadesh, the holy place. Uh, the tabernacle, the, ten, the temple, it's the day of sounding or the day of blowing. Um, they would stand outside. There was two different types of trumpets that would be used. One was the shofar, which was the basic one that is required, but also there would be silver trumpets. So in many times, uh, the priest would blow both types of trumpets, both the shofar and the silver trumpets, uh, on the first part of the uh season of trumpets. Rosh Hashanah is commemorated with trumpet blasts. As a matter of fact, prior to Rosh Hashanah, I can't say it right, Rosh Hashanah, the shofar is blown to call people to repent, to remind them that the holy days are arriving. The ram's horn is mentioned in the Bible in Joshua 6.4 and in 1 Chronicles 15. But on this time frame, the trumpet or the shofar in the uh, synagogues where they celebrate it is blown during this time frame 100 times. 100 times of blowing the horn. Fruktamam says the 100th blast, and this is critical, the 100th blast is known as the Takeya Gadola. It means the last trump. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Uh, it's a long, continuous sound which ends when the blower runs out of breath. This blast signifies the hope of redemption. Now, trumpet blowing in the Bible is used for many different things. One of them was the gathering of the people, which when we make the connection between this and the rapture, you'll see that it is being blown for the gathering of God's people. But this is kind of what it sounds like. Here's the long one. Anybody here sucking air? It's like, how on earth did you blow it that long? But that was the last trump of the of the day. The, what happens then, there is a thing called the 10 days of repentance with Rosh Hashanah. It begins with the first day and then ends, ends with Yom Kippur on the last day. And this makes up what is called the High Holy Days. Right now, or will be here in just a little while, here in eastern United States, when the sun goes down, the trumpet sounds will begin to blast all over in synagogues here and in Israel. Many Jewish people attend Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur services, even if they didn't attend synagogue services the rest of the year. It's kind of like many Christians. They show up on Christmas and Easter. You know, I'll I never forget the, the pastor that on Easter Sunday when the people were sitting out there, he said, for those of you, I won't see till then, Merry Christmas. And that's a sad thing to say, but fortunately it's not a part of West Side. Amen. But you have the 10 days of all. The first two days are the Feast of Trumpets. This is the only two-day festival that is that is laid in on these specific type of things. Um, it follows with seven days for a total of 10 days, ending with Yom Kippur. And it's significant that Rosh Hashanah is the only two-day uh, event. Uh, it, it, in the Bible, it's considered a one-day event, but because or since the Babylonian captivity, uh, it was stretched out into a two-day event um, because the people in Babylon weren't real sure 
when sundown in Israel actually was. And so to make sure that it didn't get missed, they made it out into a two-day celebration, and that continues to this day. Jewish tradition says, and this is where the idea of repentance and so forth comes in, um, that God writes every person's words, deeds, and thoughts in the book of life, which he opens on Rosh Hashanah. You have to understand that the teaching of Judaism is about works. And what they say about the book of life is based on the tradition of man. And they have fitted it into the scriptures. If you notice in that passage, it says nothing about many of these things. It says nothing about that God's going to open the book of life and you're going to be judged by your works. <clears throat> but this is the way they think. This is their tradition. If your good works, your good deeds out, outnumber your sinful ones for that last year of evaluation, then your name's going to be inscribed in the book of life for another year on Yom Kippur which means you'll have another year of life and another year of blessing. It's not an eternal life issue. It's the next year of your life. During Rosh Hashanah and the 10 days of repentance, people can repent of their sins and do good deeds to increase their chances of being inscribed in the book of life. Let me check something here. Seemed like I lost something. Jewish tradition holds that there are three books that are open. One book is called the book of death. It's for the absolutely wicked. Their names will not be written in the book of life for the coming year. Many believe that means that you will die before that year is over. Others, you may not die, but you're certainly not going to be blessed. Another book for the perfectly righteous, their names are written in the book of life for the coming year because they've been so good. But you know that most of us, even ourselves, would be called in-betweeners, wouldn't we? So they know that most people are in-betweeners. And so those borderline cases, the righteous are immediately written in the book of life for a year of blessing. The wicked are immediately written in the book of death for a year of misfortune. The destiny of those in the borderline cases hangs in the balance until Yom Kippur. Thus, with Rosh Hashanah was a day of penitence, a day of uncertainty. And between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the acceptable greeting is, may you be inscribed and sealed for another good year. You notice when I said, Happy New Year to you a while ago, I did not say that. You are inscribed in the book of life, and it's not that book. There may be a book of, there is a book of deeds for believers, but it has nothing to do with your destiny as far as where you're going to spend eternity. The book of life here, again, has nothing to do with eternal life. <clears throat> if you remember our study of the life of the Messiah, so many people believe, if they believe anything at all about the kingdom of God, the, the vast number of Jewish people are agnostic or atheists. As what's, uh, what most people don't realize is that one of the most promoting of things like homosexuality and lesbianism and transgenderism and so many other very left-wing stuff comes out of Israel. Um, you, do, you do know that Karl Marx himself, the father of communism, was Jewish. Not only was he Jewish, but he figured that because of his life, and he lived an absolutely abominable, if you've ever read about his life, he was about as wicked as wicked come. He just says, well, I guess I'm headed to the devil. And he was. But anyhow, the third book is open for those not in either of the first two books. <laughs> Ordinary people, they're not perfectly evil, they're not perfectly good. And so during the next 10 days, after the first two days of Rosh Hashanah, they try and do lots of good stuff. So try and convince God to write their names into the book of blessing or the book of life for the coming year. That's why another name for the feast, uh, according to rabbinic Judaism, is Yom Hadin, meaning the day of judgment. 
Arnold Fruchtenbaum says, according to rabbinic Judaism, all Jews pass by God in judgment on this day to see if their sins will or will not be forgiven. <clears throat> One of the reasons why it's so difficult to reach Jewish people is because they're so ingrained in good works. Like so many people in the Christian world, they absolutely believe that when their good works outweigh their bad works, they're going to make it to heaven. As though the God has this great balance scale going on. That goes back to one of the greatest lies that Satan ever put in. That your eternal life is about how good you are in time. It's important to note in Judaism, when people speak about being in the book of life, they're referring to physical life and blessings in time. It's not spiritual life. It's not about being saved in phase one salvation, the gift of eternal life. One of the big problems that Jesus constantly had dealing with the, the Pharisees was their constant hammering works, 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 works. And when he offered the free gift of salvation without any commitment at all, just believe in him for eternal life, they wanted to crucify him because, for one thing, it was taking away their power over the people. You know, one of the things I've always said about, for example, Roman Catholic priests, I'm kind of jealous in a way. Because if you go against him, what can he do? I'll just make sure you go to hell because it's in my control. No, you can come to confession all you want. Not listening. I won't burn a candle, for, say a mass for you. So you better be nice and better, you know, give to the church. Did I say that wrong? Those that had Catholic background? No. More or less. Priest doesn't have to. Huh? <laughs> so anyhow, none of this tradition about the book of life is, is true. It's simply man-made. God does have a book of life. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. When you believe in Jesus for eternal life, you're in the Lamb's Book of Life. The only way to have that name inscribed in there is to believe his promise to give you eternal life. All who will believe in him. So let's look at the prophetic significance of the idea of the Feast of Trumpets, because this is where we come in. We need to remember the single most important thing about the seven feasts of Israel is they all point to the Lord Jesus Christ. They all point to him. If you get that, then you'll understand all the rest of it. Now, we look at the, the, the Jewish way or, or Judaism's way of looking at the feasts and what they do and what they don't do, and we 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 study those things. Some of those things are, we, we make sure that we point out how they point to the Lord Jesus Christ and so forth. Um, so it's important for us to know what they're thinking, and it's important to know what does the scripture really mean when it says what it says. When it says this about the Feast of Trumpets, what on earth is it talking about? Well, ultimately, here's the seven feasts. On Passover, what did they do? There was the Passover lamb. That's in your typology there in the next page over jesus was the passover lamb jesus died on passover note that don't let that get away from you. then at the feast of the unleavened bread which followed close on the hills of the passover jesus was buried the unleavened bread signifies his sinless humanity we talk about that when we have Communion on a regular basis. But then first fruits. First fruits is when Jesus rose from the dead. On the exact day of the celebration of that feast, Jesus rose from the dead and the first ever to receive a glorified body. Remember, Jesus is fully God and fully man. If you have any questions about that, read John 1, read Hebrews 1, read Philippians 2, and so forth. Then following that is the Feast of Weeks. Jesus sent the Spirit of God and the church began. It's also called Pentecost. That's the day the church began. Man did not begin the church. God did. 
Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And we are his body. God is now working through individuals of any nationality and not just the specific nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, it's wonderful because both Jews and Gentiles are now one body in Christ. The next then, that was the spring feast. Now comes the fall feast. And with the feast of trumpets, the picture of that in typology or the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work is Israel's spiritual awakening that's going to come with the rapture of the church. There are some people have a misunderstanding that because all of these things are Jewish Jewish things, that somehow or another the trumpets uh, it doesn't include the church. But what they miss is that, and we'll talk about this in a second, that the rapture of the church on the Feast of Trumpets is almost immediately followed by or very closely followed by the spiritual awakening of thousands within the nation of Israel. Out of that's going to come, for example, the 144,000. But then you have atonement, which is in uh, uh, Leviticus uh, 23, begins at uh, verse 26, goes down through 36. That's the tribulation period. That with trumpets, there's going to be an individual spiritual awakening of many Jewish people and Gentile people. I think I'm ahead of myself, but that's okay. But the nation as a such, as such, does not turn to Jesus as their Messiah. The tribulation leads to Israel's national repentance. Remember, one of the things that we learned is that what initiates or what starts the second coming, what brings the tribulation period to a dead end exactly seven years down, it is when the leadership of the nation of Israel, at the, the, that leadership that 2,000 years ago called for his crucifixion and led the people to crucify him, the leadership of Israel has to not only acknowledge him as their Jewish Messiah, but we find out in, in Zechariah 14 that they, they repent of it, they turn back to the Lord, and they call on him to return. When they call on him to return, reversing what happened 2,000 years ago, then, then and only then does the second coming happen. You hear me? All right. And then the third is tabernacles. Tabernacles is what? Tabernacles is the messianic kingdom. The messianic kingdom, the thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So on the Feast of Trumpets, the prophetic significance of it. I firmly believe that the most amazing journey of all time is going to happen at the Feast of Trumpets. You see, the rapture of the church is what fulfills the typology of the Feast of Trumpets. And it includes Israel's response to the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. Turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thess 4. One Thess 4. <laughs> 13. 1 Thess 4.13. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Are you there? Say amen. You don't know where 1 Thessalonians is? Say on me. All right. Listen. We do not want you to be uninformed brethren. And, you know, there is a church called the Brethren Church. They're the Plymouth Brethren. And there's the United Brethren. You can probably be any of those brethren, but you just can't be an uninformed brethren. Anyhow. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. There it is, that's what he says. About those who are asleep. Now, asleep for the believer is the closest thing you can have to describe what the believer's physical death is like. They don't have any more physical activity with the body of this time frame within here. They are they, they have a temporary body of some kind that they're with the Lord. They're fully conscious and fully awake and fully participating. But so there's talking about here believers who have died from the time the church was established on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, all the way up 
to the, the rapture of the church. We do not want you to be uninformed brethren about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, amen, all right? Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord stop. Alive and remain, there's going to be a generation of people, and I pray God is you and me. <laughs> that we don't have to pass through the doors of death. It doesn't matter through the doors of death. It means we simply are absent from the body and present with the Lord. Just like that, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. But nonetheless, I think it would be more fun not to have to go that way. But we, until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have already died and passed away, they're actually going to have a split second more time with the Lord than you. They, they get to go home, they get to go to be with the Lord a split second faster than you do. But it's all in a split second, a nanosecond. Well, now look, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. <laughs> with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. That's where the word rapture comes from because of the Latin translation. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Seven sequential things happen in the rapture of the church. One, the Lord Jesus Christ descends from heaven. You know what I like about that, Aunt Lulu? I like the fact the Lord doesn't say to someone else, hey, go get them. I'm going to hang out here for a while in heaven. The Lord loves us so much, he not only went to the cross for us, but he's coming out of the gates of glory to come into the air and to say, come on, kids, we're going home. The Lord himself. You're going to see the Lord just like that. The Lord himself will descend from heaven. And then there's going to be a great shout of command. Kalusma is probably the voice of Jesus. It's a military command. And the command will be for the next events of the rapture to occur. Michael, who's the only archangel, repeats the command with a loud voice. By the way, what did the Lord say when he stood at the tomb of Lazarus? Lazarus with a loud voice. Lazarus, come forth. You know why he said Lazarus? Because if he just said come forth, all the dead would have popped right out. So he had to target the one. <laughs> well, what's he going to say here? Church age, come forth. The Old Testament believers aren't out now. This is simply a church age event. But the, Michael the archangel repeats the command with a loud voice. That's a typical thing with the command structure in ancient times, probably even in modern times. You know, you go on to a, you watch movies with submarines and so forth. Commander says, dive, dive, and, you know, dive. And then what happens? The next guy gets on the mic and says, dive, dive, dive. He's repeating the command. So it's the same way here with Michael the Archangel. And then there's a trumpet blast. Mm -mm -mm -mm. The last trumpet. The trumpet blast. The feast of trumpets will be fulfilled. And the dead in Christ will rise. It doesn't matter where they are, how they died, what happened to their bodies. You know, people for thousands of years have been dying that they have, there ain't no body left. But you know what it is? Because the Lord knows where every smidgen piece of you is. And you're still going to be you. In other words, like I've said before, you plant Dean, you're going to get Dean. Uh, it's the way it happens. But the dead in Christ will rise first. Then the living believers are raptured. Suddenly, and in the, in the, the idea of a twinkling of an eye is the idea of when light glances off of your eyeball. 
It's just that instantaneous. It's not even hardly a nanosecond. In other words, you're going down the road, driving, having a good old time, listen to your radio. Hopefully you listen to good music. And suddenly you're going to hear a shout. The Lord says, church age, come up, trumpet. You're gone. Your car's going to go down the road. And airplane's going to fall out of the sky. You're out of here. Just like that. You don't have time to say, oh, Lord, wait just a minute. Let me change, put Christian music on. <laughs> you don't have time to sit at the house to turn off the television, pull out your Bible to look spiritual. We all want to meet the Lord in the air, above the earth. He doesn't come to the earth until the second part of the second coming. That's at the end of the tribulation. This is the first part of the second coming. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. Let's put it simple. We're going to fly. I'll, I'll fly away. Ain't that so? I'll fly away, oh glory. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce, I remember your, your dad was saying, I'll fly away, glory. <laughs> My mom said, I don't want to fly. I said, well, mom, it's, it's going to happen. So you'll be ready for it when it happens. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. 1 Corinthians 15. You love the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 15. <clears throat> now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now stop there for a quick second. Let me just plug this in for you. This tells you in order for someone, and you understand these terms, I don't have to define them, for someone to inherit the kingdom, they have to be in their immortal body. People in their human body cannot inherit the kingdom. So we'll have to remember that because it applies to a lot of people for the coming out of the tribulation and even on into the millennial kingdom. So flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You've got to have that actually a, a glorified body. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Oh, no. Here comes the oldest joke I've told in this church. I, I, can't, I can't help myself. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. That happened a few minutes ago whenever they took the baby out. He was, she wasn't sleeping, but I saw diapers. She's going out to be changed. So they hang it off a nursery wall. Anyhow, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Wait, didn't we hear something about a last trumpet? This is the connection of the Feast of Trumpets. It's going to become even more exact with this. What is that last trumpet? That long, loud blast that coordinates, coordinates with the Feast of Trumpets. The trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be chained. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. The reason is that so you'll be able to inherit if you're qualified. But when this perishable, listen, have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, based on all of this, you know, I could stay here for two weeks. Therefore, my beloved brethren, because this is going to happen, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. By the way, when the scriptures were written, there were no chapters or verses. Pastor Burris, you'll know where I'm going. Because what's the very next verse? Now concerning the collection for the saints. <laughs> Ain't that something? 
Always abounding in the work of the Lord concerning the collection for the saints. Always abounding in what? Financial giving. But these verses tell us the rapture and resurrection will happen instantaneously. There will be a trumpet blast called the last trumpet. The dead are raised first. Living believers will be changed. The new body will be imperishable and immortal. We have learned that some will have a glorified body. Those who have the glorified body will inherit the kingdom. And we have studied that. There will be no death for believers. This is called a victory. What a great victory. This victory is only through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a Savior we have. What a Savior we have. Amen. Now, I personally believe that the world is going to hear that trumpet blast. I really do. Including the Jewish people. The trumpet blast and the sudden departure of believers. We're here. We're gone. And by the way, I know there's more than one lady that has said, I hope the Lord gives me enough time to at least grab my underwear. Listen, don't you worry about it. You ain't going to be naked. But anyhow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me leave it alone. The trumpet blast, sudden departure of believers, Jew and Gentile alike, is the event that logically... Don't ask me for chapter and verse, but I look at things logically. Logically is going to turn many, many Jews to believe in Messiah Yeshua. We go over. When these Jewish people come to faith in the Messiah for his promise of eternal life. We can understand. We can go over to Revelation chapter 7 uh, and 4 through 8 and 9 through 17 and so forth. The, the fact of 144,000. Now, there's a group of people called Jehovah's Witnesses that say Jeho that it's Jehovah's Witnesses, the first ones up on the line to believe in Jehovah and, you know, my, in, in, in Jesus as Michael the Archangel and all the other weird stuff. you got to work your way to heaven. I had a Jehovah's Witness call me the other day. He didn't know who he got. And he said, uh, hi, sir. Uh, just making a phone, some phone calls today. Can, can I read a scripture to you? Sure, of course you can. I already had my antenna up. And he read me something about works and repentance and so forth. And I said, well, that all, that all sounds great. But I said, you know, the biggest thing I need to pray for you is the fact that you're being deceived. Because Jesus is the eternal God. He's not a created being. He says, well, but, but this, and he tried to give me some things. And I said, and the other thing is, it's a gift that you receive for eternal life. It's not a matter of works. And he said, you know what he did? He says, okay, have a nice day. I've been praying for him ever since. Hope he calls back. But anyhow, the 144,000. Go to Revelation 7. Let's just solve this real quick. Oh, my goodness. If any of the Jehovah's Witnesses are not Jewish, and if they're married and have children or any such thing as that, they don't qualify on multiple levels. Plus, this is the time they're exposed. that They're going to be serving mostly during the tribulation period. This is their time of service. But they have to come to the Lord prior to or just at the beginning of the tribulation. I believe it's prior to shortly after the rapture and the trumpet. Look what it says. Revelation 7, 5. From the tribe, uh, okay, here's, wait. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Sons of Israel are what people? The Jewish. More specific than that. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000. Tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Tribe of Gad, 12,000. And on and on and on until you get 144,000. That's the 144,000. They're also called the first fruits to the Lord. First fruits was a, the celebration where they were, it was a time of the harvest. 
and you had all of the harvest there, and they gathered portions of the harvest to go and wave it before the Lord in thanksgiving. So the 144,000 are not the total harvest. They are a portion of the total harvest. If you look at it right. Mm -hmm. So with the result of what has happened, this is in the tribulation period. I believe these things go from the very beginning of the tribulation period is what it seems to lay out. So they came to faith in the Lord prior to the tribulation period or at the very beginning, or I would predict some months or even years prior to the beginning of the tribulation period, personal opinion. But the trumpet blast and the sudden departure of believers is what's going to turn them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Romans 11, 11 and 12, it talks about, and all of Israel will be saved. Now that goes all the way down to the tribulation period in the remnant of Israel. But this is a very large number of Jewish people. And they become Jewish evangelists. I know that because if you look at verse 9, the very next thing is, there is a great multitude which no one can count from every nation and all tribes of people and tongues standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches were in their hands. And, <clears throat> and you go down to uh, verse 13, the one of the elders answered, uh, uh, these who are clothed in white robes, who are they? Where, do, where have they come from? So one of the people of the church age people asked the question. And I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, look, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They believed in Yeshua for eternal life. What brought them to that? More than anything is 144,000 multilingual Jewish young men who are virgins who go out and evangelize the world. And it says in Matthew that every tongue and tribe will hear Matthew 24, 14. The gospel of the kingdom begins with phase one salvation, then points to the messianic kingdom. So then it lays out like this. Trumpets is the rapture in the air. Then we have the 10 days of awe. Many Jews will believe. It does not have to be exactly 10 days between the rapture and the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. The 10 days of all is not actually in the scripture. It is something that they have titled. Then you have atonement. Now, it could be. It could be that false. I don't know. I'm out of here with the rapture, so let them worry about it. But I think it has, it will be further out than that, personal opinion. And then you have that the 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 the, the fast of the the uh, of 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 the festival of atonement. Festival is not the right word, but the, the the fasting with the day of of atonement. That's the representing the seven year tribulation. At the end of the seven year tribulation, the nation of Israel repents. The people, many of the people, are already believers. You have the hundred forty four thousand plus. Many of them are believers. <clears throat> But the Jewish national leaders have not yet met the condition of and accepting Jesus as the Messiah and inviting him to return. When they do that, and all of the forces of the Antichrist, all of the forces of Satan, and the end of the last stage of the campaign of Armageddon, every demon that there has ever been are all coming at Israel. The national leadership seems to be in Basra, down in, in southern Lebanon. Am I familiar with the name Lebanon? In southern and, and and there they're finally going to call on the name of the Lord. It's not Lebanon, Southern Jordan. My fault. I knew something was wrong. Southern Jordan. Probably at Petra. There they're going to call on the name of the Lord. And then you have the Lord's return to the earth. And then after the 75 days, you have the kingdom reign. So several questions have to be asked. And with this, we're almost ready to wrap up. Since all the spring feasts, and we can demonstrate that they were, were fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ on the exact day of the appointed time laid out in Leviticus 23. The exact day. Will the fall feast happen likewise? That's a question. 
I can't really answer that question, except I'll give you what seems to make logical sense to me. Due to the past fulfillments of the appointed times and the things we have learned about this feast and what it points to, I personally believe the rapture is going to happen at this feast. Now, the sun is almost down outside. <laughs> if I hear a shout and a trumpet, I'm gone. And I'm confident that this church will be an empty shell. Because <laughs> we're going home. But it's also a two-day event. So Jesus said, you don't know the day or the hour. That's correct. It's a two-day event. Now, <clears throat> however, having said my personal opinion, it is possible the rapture is not going to happen on the day of the biblically assigned time of celebration. If that's true, then even though the first four were fulfilled on the exact days, the last three are fulfilled according to sequence rather than the exact day. And that's possible, but I really don't think so. You don't know the day or the hour, but it still falls in this time frame. The Feast of Trumpets then is the rapture of the church of the body of Christ. We've seen in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, the context of all of that deals with the tribulation period. Oh, go, go with me, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. I didn't take you there. Let's go there real quick. I'm almost done. 5, 9. 1 Thess 5, 9. How do you know we're not going through the tribulation period? Well, there are several things, but here's one of them. Probably the most critical one. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be looking for him, not looking for the Antichrist. Looking for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. Now, whenever I see the G9, the G10, the G12, or the whatever the people are, I always look around. I don't look at the big guys standing up getting their pictures. I want to look at the little guy that's around behind them somewhere. That could be him. But be that as it may, it's before the tribulation period. The entire tribulation period is the wrath of God, all seven years. Don't fall into the trap of those that say, oh, that wrath of God, that's only the middle of the tribulation, so the church's got to be out of here by the middle of the tribulation. We're going to go through the first half, woe is me. I'm looking for the Antichrist. Oh, fooey. Look all you want. The Lord Jesus Christ is not the Antichrist. When you go up and I go up, I'm going to look at you and say, I told you so. Amen. It is pre-tribulational. It is before the millennial kingdom. And therefore it is pre-millennial. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. I want you to look. You still open at first Thess five. Look at verse 10. I want you to notice this promise of eternal security. We're waiting for the obtaining salvation. What's the word salvation it means deliverance, right? So the salvation here is not phase one salvation. You get to go to heaven when you die. This is deliverance from his wrath. Who died for us so that Purpose clause, whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Some people want to say, well, that means whether you're physically alive or physically dead. That's not the context. What he's talking about is sleepy believers who are not living for the Lord. He's talking about those who are awake, who are alert. They're watching for his coming. And I can show you all this stuff. I don't have time. Uh, those who are ready for his coming, those who are serving, those who are learning, they're awake. They're waiting for the Lord. They're looking for him to come. But then you've got all the sleepy believers don't bother to come to church, they don't read their Bibles, and live their life on their own terms. But you know what? What's it say? Whether we're awake or asleep, we will live together with him. You know, even the sleepy believers when they hear the trumpet are going to have to wake up for that split second because you're gone whether you're ready or not. 
It's sort of like, remember the old thing we used to play as kids? Hide and seek, here I come, ready or not. That's the way it is with the Lord. Ready or not, he's coming. And because you've believed in him for eternal life, you get to go home, even if you're like, uh-oh. Because, you know, John says in First John, we can be ashamed before him at his coming. That's the sleepy believers. So you wonder why I constantly am talking to us about be ready, be ready, be ready. That's the Feast of Trumpets. In the Reader's Digest, as fast as I could go through it, version. But hopefully it reminded us of what we are to be doing and the responsibility we have before the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. Build one another up in what? The faith. Encouraging people to be strong. Encouraging people to stay faithful in the faith. That's our responsibility to each other. By the way, if you're not regularly in Bible class, you can't do that, can you? That's it. And you know, one of the, let me tell you something, one of the greatest ways you can encourage somebody else is be here. The biggest problem we have in so many churches is the fact that I have a bunch of wooden headed Christians. I know they're wooden headed because there's one, two, three, four, five, all the wood that I have with no bodies on. Of course, we have our bad boys, bad girls place in the back. But And some people say, you don't understand my bum and those benches don't work very well. I do understand that. Uh, so anybody that wants to donate about $4,000 to pad our pews, please write the check uh, out to Westside Baptist Church. Here we will go. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to take just, uh, Keith, we're going to have just, uh, I'm going to just ask you to come up and lead us in prayer. And uh, then you go to the Lord with your own needs and concerns. Take time to go before the Lord. Uh, I'm just going to ask Keith to close us tonight in prayer. Uh, but we are to lift up to the Lord those things. It says, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. That's your job. So as we finish tonight, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Keith. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for just such a wonderful Bible study tonight. We had the precious word. We thank you for uh, both pastors here tonight. Lord, we thank you for all of the hard work that they uh, do day in and day out for each and every one of us who might be able to grow uh, in the faith, Lord, but ultimately there at the judgment seat of Christ. It's, all that we can all hear, well done, good and faithful. For tonight, as we learned all about Israel, all about all the different feasts you commanded them to have, we know it's all given to you as the Messiah. Messiah, not only Israel and Jerusalem, but the Messiah of the entire world. Everyone can have the free gift of eternal life. I pray everyone here and everyone on Zoom, Lord, uh, can have the, the courage to share their faith those around them, their cerebral Lord, and that by you and the Holy Spirit working through them, Lord, that everyone that hears can believe, Lord, become part of your family, the children of God. We lift up their hearts and to you, pray for their strength and their courage as they fight that fear fight. Knowing that not only did you use the Jews to give us the scriptures, Lord, but all Growing in faith, he has all the Old Testament. We know and we learn if we study for ourselves. We know that he used Israel and Judah and the kings and the judges and all the Old Testament and prophets, Lord, to teach us so many different Bible lessons. And that's not only for his here and now, Lord, but for the, for the future, for future things. His pastor was touching on tonight, Lord, about the millennial kingdom and then the eternal kingdom that never passes away. And we pray Lord, that we can hear and get to see all of those different things, but have the blessings here and now as you promise uh, to all those who love you, Lord, to the mature sons, to the mature Michael and sons of because of our love for you and your precious word. May we always honor and lift your word and you up, Lord, as you have placed uh, the word of even above your. Anymore because it's it's so powerful. We thank you so much for it tonight.
I pray that you see us all safe behind the night. But until that great day that you come into the class, all of all home in the rapture, Lord, until that day, may we be found faithful. And we all be here Sunday. And encourage those who aren't here tonight, haven't been for Sundays to, in the past. May we encourage them to be here. Be here Sunday. Get to be a part of us that Baptist church, but more importantly, around brothers and sisters in Christ. So, for it's in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. I commend you now to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and peace be with you. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you, and we will see you on Sunday. And if the yeah unless the lord returns in which case i'll see you in the air where is my therapist